It is on, yep. Yeah. So it's got turned on. We're uh, calling this work session to order. We'll start with a roll call. Christopher Constant. Forrest Dunbar. Yeah. Felix Rivera. Austin Davidson. John Weddleton. Pete Peterson. Dennis Great. And um, as we're going through, if, if you speak, please uh, state your name for the record. Do we have anyone on the phone? Mr. Chair, Mr. Trini is on the phone. I'm trying to get the mute and the speakers correct. So okay. It's going to take us just a sec. Okay. And hopefully we'll be joined by Mr. Dyson. Have you heard anything about that, Mr. Mboski? Okay. I know he was out of town a couple days ago, but I was hoping you'd be here for this discussion. Okay. Well, uh, let us begin. Um, who is presenting first? So we have two presentations. Who wants to go first? I'm happy to go first. Who, who is set up to go first right now? If it's you, that's fine. Okay. I, I have no preference. Okay. All right. Well, I'm Bill Fossey, the municipal manager. Um, we, this is time for the assembly to get an update on the Power Reserve, which could be the very first project use Inglou's innovative new water transmission improvement district tariff provisions. And this is something of an involved story that is new to a lot of folks on the assembly. So in order to give you a sense of where we are, I thought it would be helpful to describe how we got here and what the process we are involved in is. So I'm going to start at the beginning, which is a potentially unexpected beginning place to start, which is once upon a time the municipality had a dispute over how monies from landfill gas produced by the decomposing garbage at the Anchorage Regional Landfill would be distributed. We settled that case in early 2017, and without going too much into that history, we did find that was kind of a tricky puzzle to solve. One, time, one way you can solve tricky puzzles is to make the problem bigger. We made the problem a little bit bigger, and we evolved the powder reserve project in that settlement. How the Reserve Project is a long plan for a master plan community, and it had some separate problems, which were not related directly to the landfill gas project, but like any big new housing development, it had some water and sewer needs. <coughs> it will break and learn a little bit vocabulary. This is going to be helpful to us as we march on forward. We needed some sewer improvements, and in the sewer improvement world, we have big trunk lines. We have smaller lateral mains of the individual connections from house to the lateral main. It also needed water improvements. And here, it was gonna need a big transmission main for reasons we'll describe in greater detail later. Smaller distribution mains and then individual connections. Let me back that up here. And because this is gonna be important terminology, we'll do a visual here. Big transmission main on the water line. There's a big pipe just running in some arbitrary place for purposes of today. It runs from here to the door. You cannot connect directly to the pipe because it is the big backbone that serves everybody. The distribution main you can think of as a smaller pipe that's in the road in front of your house. So it's running here on powder reserve land across the table, right? The problem was AMU had abilities to help developers bring into existence a sewer trunk line, <laughs> a sewer trunk line, lateral mains, and distribution mains, but it didn't have any kind of mechanism to bring a transmission main into existence. That was a known problem, and we had known about it for a while, but I'll tell you what the potential solution was. We already had had, sort of time immemorial, accepted the invitation from state statute to create improvement districts. What is an improvement district? At its highest level, at its core, an improvement district is a mechanism for ABLU to be a banker. It will build the distribution lines. And as a result of that, it will get paid back through assessments on the property. So we're all living on Powder Ridge Lane. The developer doesn't have to pay to put the distribution line in if it uses an improvement district. But as soon as AWU finishes that project, an assessment goes on your property, and then you, because you live on this lane, are now going to pay us back over time. The problem was. We had that for distribution mains for water, rather for trunk lines for sewer, for lateral mains for sewer, but we didn't have it for a water transmission main. And the ABLE board recognized that as a limitation long ago. In 2015, they said, hey, we should take this solution and put it on water transmission mains too. 
So we had thought that that might be a helpful process to move this project along. There have been long conversations about how to make that happen. Um, there is a wrinkle that we'll talk about. When you take this to the transmission main process, it's going to necessarily require some kind of public-private partnership joint agreement. And ultimately, that gets codified in a tariff because AWU is regulated by the RCA. So you guys get a first by the controlling it, and then the RCA ultimately has to approve it. So back to the landfill gas case. We end up involving this as part of the grand puzzle that finally brings that to a resolution. And here's what the, piece, here's what the key that unlocked the, the lock was. As part of that settlement, AWU agrees it's going to build powder acres, which is kind of a high density housing area, 45 units on two lots, and it's going to build powder hills, which is 63 minimum family residential lots. And that's not the whole project. If you're looking at the project we have here, it's sort of the bottom first two to go. This is the attachment that's on the back of the settlement agreement. Powder acres, the high density, two lots on the left. Powder hills, the 63 single family lots on the right. When are they going to do that? In the case of Powder Acres, three years. In the case of Powder Hills, five years. After we finish building the primary trunk lines. What are the primary trunk lines? The primary trunk lines are the new water transmission main, the sewer trunk main, and whatever we need to run that sewer trunk main, lift stations, other infrastructure improvements. The stuff that we need to bring water and sewer services sufficient to service Powder Acres and Powder Hills. How are we going to actually build those things? Here's where we're going to go way down the rabbit hole. And we're going to get fully intimately acquainted with the AWU new, new tariff regime. Section 2.1.3 is very dense. I'm going to take it out of its original form and put it up in pieces. We agree in 2.1.3 that the municipality in AWU will take our diligent and best efforts to get a bunch of approvals. First, we are going to ask you guys can we adopt a new tariff that we propose to the RCA that will let us enter into the Infrastructure Coordination Agreements, ICAs, it's going to be some vocabulary for us in a minute, that will let us front the cost of building primary trunk lines, and in particular, water transmission lines, and get paid back later through assessments? If you said yes, we would then go and get RCA approval for that. If the RCA said you're allowed to do that, we would then ask you, can we do it to make the powder reserve project a reality? We will ask you for authority to create improvement districts or a single improvement district that allows us to build primary trunk lines and get paid back. We don't get to decide that. We get to decide whether to ask the question to voters. So then if you said yes, we will go to the people who have benefited properties that are in those improvement districts, ask them if they want to build the improvement districts. And if yes, then we have to, and, and that's one of the necessary pieces. Sorry, this red one's a little hard to read. And the last piece of the puzzle is both parties, the municipality of Nehru and the Klukna, will have to agree to an infrastructure coordination agreement that allocates the upfront costs of building those primary trunk lines. Now, in practice, the way we did it, A, B, C, D was a little out of order, but E really kind of has to come before D until we know who's paying for what. It's hard to tell voters, do you want to build this? Because that's going to affect what cost they get us at. So 2.1.3 has put us on a path. But we also were very clear in 2.1.3 how this is going to work. If we, tr we didn't control all of that. We couldn't guarantee to anybody that you would let us pass a tariff, that the RCA would impose a tariff, that we could agree on district boundaries, that people in the Klutna, virtually Eagle River, Chew Gap would say yes to that. So we said, if we diligently and in good faith ask for any of those approvals and it falls apart, we don't have to build the primary trunk lines because then we will not have a mechanism to do it. And we made that clear, we said twice, with the avoidance of doubt, our huh. obligation to build them is conditioned on AWU getting back its upfront costs. And we also said, it doesn't prohibit us from doing anything else. If somebody brings us money, we'll build it, that's fine. And in particular, there is one very standard way in which other people bring us money from time to time. A lot of times when developers build projects, they do a private development project, they build a line, and then they give it to AWU. Sometimes they give the money to AWU, we build a line, and then we just keep it. And we said, if that works out, if it can and is met by some other arrangement, we'll do our part. So 
So there it is, and it's all in all of its glory, 2.1.3. And we signed the settlement in January 2017. So now we're on a path. Here's our process. We're going to ask you guys for a tariff change. We're going to go to the RCA. We're going to get your permission to go ask the voters. We're going to figure out what all of this costs. And then hopefully, in the end, everyone gives us the thumbs up and we're off to the next. <coughs> so, to retrace the history here, it turns out that because this tariff question had been under discussion as a potential solution both for this project and for some others, it was actually before the settlement agreement. We gave that to the assembly in December. And now let's learn about how this new tariff actually works. So the brand new tariff that allows us to create water transmission improvement districts has a bunch of rules. I'll give you the first three because they're going to be the most relevant to our discussion. If you want to build a transmission district for able to front the cost and get tied back to assessments, first you got to figure out what parcels are eventually going to be served or potentially going to be served by this district. You've got to figure out what all of this costs. And it's got to work for ABU too because ABU is, is the bank in this, right? So ABU has some free cash. So if ABU has enough free cash that they can be out of this money for a while, they can do it. And now here are three specific rules in the codified tariff. The general manager has the discretion to proceed only if we can do it in six years. It's not going to black blow out higher priority projects because there's a finite amount of cash ABU has. And this is going to be our biggie. The project has to be economically feasible for ABU, or there's got to be an agreement that guarantees that someone is going to connect to the big line and therefore trigger all of the assessments being levied, or someone's going to pay the utility back to recover all of AWU's fronted cash. And that's important because remember, here's, here's the picture of powder reserve today. It's raw land. And what we don't want to have happen is AWU to take $20 million that it has in its bank account and build lines where, for whatever reason, the project doesn't come through. 40 years later, we've got lines in the ground and no houses. AWU just lost all of its cash. It's never going to get paid back. There's no upside, even if it project ultimately does come through. So that's the failure mode. That's what we're trying to avoid. So we put that on the table on December 20th, <coughs> and then it gets approved by assembly the day after everybody signs the settlement agreement. So that's good news. We start. We're one day after the settlement agreement. We're already through step one. And then next step on the train, you go to the RCA three days later. RCA takes a little time, but they approve it. March 17th, we're trucking along, we're making good progress. One, two. Then we have to ask you for approval to create these districts. And now this candidly took a little bit of time to work out. So November 21st, we send the sewer improvement district to the assembly. And this one was relatively simpler. The line that creates the Patos boundary for the sewer improvement district is the same line that defines the powder reserve project. This is a good time to stop, remind ourselves about how the money flows here. Nobody has to pay anything until the assessments are levied. So when you create the district, you'll say this sewer project costs $8 billion. There's some free floating, unpaid $8 billion bill that nobody has to pay. But then the money does become due when the assessments are levied. What triggers the levying? It's when somebody creates a lateral improvement district that builds the sewer line under your road, or someone does a private development that builds the sewer line under your road that connects to the main trunk of the road. And once that happens, you as owners of lot one, two, three, and four of Powder Hills, now you have potentially up to 30 years to pay your individual assessment back because it's finance. It's not one big lump sum. Okay, that one was relatively easy because the sewer trunk improvement only really benefits this project. And that got approved December 19th. That was the only meeting I've ever called into. I was very hot sitting in Hawaii calling until 2 in the morning. <laughs> um, got into a little bit of wrinkle on the transmission improvement district for water. Why is that? Here's what the proposed water transmission boundary looks like. The first thing you will notice is it is a lot bigger than the sewer transmission district. Why is that? It turns out, if you want to build the whole project, you've got to tap into a line that, that runs sort of along the road there. 
And the good news is there is a place to tap into it. It's sort of somewhere near A, here, point A. And you'd think if you tap in there and draw a line straight up, no problem. The problem is the engineers say if you build out the whole thing and you tap in there with just a dead end, this, the pressures are not sufficient, the system's not going to work. So you can't just do that. You have to do something else. And the engineers say the something else is you got to build a loop. Orient ourselves. Here's Chugiak High School. It turns out there's another place to tap into the big, big line up there. So you got to get from A to B. If you get from A to B, somehow you're dragging the line through these people's area. And these people, according to the language of the tariff, are all potentially benefited properties. And they were not so happy to be involved in this story. Not all. Not all of them. Some of them. Some of them. That's right. Some very vocal folks. And, and the reason they were worried was some, I think, didn't understand that if you build this project, you get a free-floating assessment that you do not have to pay. So there would be some piece of paper somewhere in some vault that says, build a $20 million water transmission main, and even though you're never going to connect to it, you've been assessed a portion of it, but you don't ever have to pay us that. But there, are, there was a trigger. The two ways that you actually have to trigger those levied assessments are, someone comes by, it's going to be like what sewer again, Someone creates a water distribution improvement district and connects the road under the street to the big line. That triggers payment, or um, and that's you get 30 years, or it's going to be private development. The problem with that was, if you live in Birchwood and you want to connect to the big line, you're tired of being on your well. Pete does not want to connect on his well. Amy does want to connect to the big line. She's off the well. If you guys get together and create a water distribution improvement district, you can force Pete into it too. And Pete says, this has got nothing to do with me. So that's why it took a little way to get to know from March to November to figure out how to keep Pete out of this. And we did. We came up with a solution to address that scenario. And that came with the improvement districts. We said, in, in this area of the municipality, because the Chigeti River Birchwood plan says there shouldn't be utilities there. This is a rural character where we have sewer, we have wells, and we have septic systems. In this place uniquely, nobody can get together and create a distribution improvement district. So Amy and Dennis, Dennis cannot conspire to make Pete pay for any portion of the water transmission. Rate. That was a tough nut to crack, but we got it. We didn't completely finish turning the ink on that until the same day we introduced it as an S version on December 19th, but that passed on December 19th, but that broke the log jam. The water improvement district is also good to go. Okay, so now we're back on track. We've got your approval to start taking this, the readiness to take to the voters. So one second, I want to know for the record we've been joined by Mr. Croft and Ms. LaFrance. Please continue. Okay, so the next thing we got to do is figure out what we are taking to the voters, and our view was that means the next step is to agree to this infrastructure coordination agreement. What do we need to have sorted out in an infrastructure coordination agreement? We've never done this before because this is new in the tariff, but here's the way we think the world goes down. We've got to figure out what exactly it is that we're building. We've got to figure out where we're building it. We've got to figure out when we're building it, because that's going to affect the finances. What does it cost all in? And we've got to figure out what parts of the project benefit existing ratepayers as opposed to those who are potentially the new ratepayers of Amy are going to come online with the new private development project. Because if we're just fixing stuff that benefits people who are already in the system, people in the system pay for that. Amy will just eat that cost. And then we take the new, the portion that benefits the new folks, and we chop it up, of course, to the, to the different lots and figure out what the pro rata assessed costs are going to be. And ultimately, we have to figure out, is it economically feasible? So we start the bidding, January 31st, we took a month, got through the holidays, and we sent our draft to Pluta. And here's what we said about all of those things. What are we building? We are building a water transmission main. We are also building sewer improvements. They're going to be the big sewer trunk, some, and the stuff that you need to run the big sewer trunk. A force main, gravity main, pump station. What does it cost? The water transmission pipe costs $20 million. The sewer for upgrades cost $8 million. That's our first estimate. We're happy to sharpen the pencil on that. 
When are we building it? Here's our proposed timeline. Who pays for what? Well, our initial take is that the water transmission line is really benefiting just the potential future residents of the Powder Reserve project. So the transmission district is going to pay for all the water improvements. But sewer is a mixed bag. There are some parts of this that AWU is going to pay for, some parts of it that's going to be shared, and some part of it that will be exclusively on the new project. And so here's a map. If you talk about this in great detail, if anyone is interested, the new project's going to pay for this forced main. We're going to abandon an old thing that has nothing to do with the current project. Other costs are going to be shared as we put in new gravity mains. Ms. Nimbasi, do you have a question? Yeah, I just want to, there's a part of the discussion that I've been a part of for years that has completely fallen off in that this connection to the Chugach vault um, has been in the ALU Capital Project for 20 years. And it's in part, so I don't think, I don't think it's an accurate assessment to say it only benefits the people in that development because this is a sole source of redundancy in this area or it would be a way to deviate the main trunk line if anything went down. So I think everybody in Anchorage who gets water from Okuna would actually benefit from it. I mean, this has been a, a pivotal portion of this discussion for all the years I've been involved. So I just didn't see that there, so I wanted, sure. I, I just want to throw that out there. And I'm happy to pick that up, I guess, when we get closer yeah. to the end here, but yes, I think and we're open to discussions about that. I don't know that building a loop from point A to point B is the way we would choose to build in redundancy for existing ratepayers if we were left completely to our own devices and there was no powder reserve project. Mm -hmm. But that's, we could discuss that. I see what I'm saying. If there's one 40 inch drunk line that comes right. from Incluna, and in that particular area, AWU has been looking for years. If that line goes down, all of Anchorage is out. How right. can we have a deviation? And the Chugach Fault was. And, and I think what I'm trying to say is. To get that redundancy benefit, we probably, but I'll look to Abu at some point, wouldn't build through raw land. We would do something over where our ratepayers are so that we would have redundancy well, that benefits well, people. Well, you're talking about going on the other side of the highway, which it, DOT has a major problem with because you have to cut up the highway. So this has been, this has been a major problem right. for the last 20 years. And, and we're open yeah. to those discussions. I mean, that's getting closer to the punchline, but yes, yeah. we're open to those discussions. But the last piece of the puzzle, is it economically feasible? And in our January 31st draft, we say, general manager says, no, it's not. Unless if Klutna agrees to give us some guarantee that either they are really going to connect these things in a certain timeline, or we get paid back. And remember, the problem is we don't want to put AWU in the position of putting $28 million into the ground, and then the economy crashes, we build it, and nobody comes. AWU has just buried its gold, and there's no way to ever get it back. Now, hopefully that doesn't happen. Hopefully what does happen is we put $28 million in the ground, you guys all build into the subdivision, you guys pay us back, the Kukna never has to pay us a dime. But if you guys don't show up, somebody's got to make AWU whole. So that's what the tariff says, we got to figure out what that guarantee is. And how does it look? Our opening pitch was, how about by year five, 25% of the assessments will be levied, or you'll make us up to 25%. Year 20, we get it all the way back. And just to be clear, all we're trying to do here is make sure that at some point, AWU is going to get repaid at some definite time. Okay, so we send that over the transit January 31st. We set up a meeting, it has to get canceled. I think there's some conflict there. March 14th, we finally do get together. I wasn't at that meeting. I've heard it did not go particularly well. I think the initial draft was not received particularly well. But as come to understand, I think that was partly due to misunderstandings. I don't know how to characterize one or the other, but I do know that what came out of it was an agreement that we will get together at staff level and we will hammer this out. So we met at AWU on March 21st, and we met again at AWU on April 5th, and then we didn't really hear a lot. Uh, we started instead getting different kinds of questions. So on April 12th, we got a new line of inquiry about how is this guarantee going to work? And so Bill Starr comes into the picture. Bill Starr sends an email to Curtis, but I'm CC, and he says, good news, I feel like we've got general consensus on multiple items, but there are some significant issues that require some additional work, and they are at least three. First, we've got to address the appropriate balance of burden regarding the infrastructure between MOA and the developers. In some cases, it might be right for us to assume the cost of the lateral distribution lines or the lift stations. Lateral distribution lines, I'll say, and we've said before, that's that doesn't really make sense to us because we don't get in the business of building lines under the neighborhood road. 
But sewer, we absolutely agree. Our proposal is we would build a good portion of the sewer. But either way, that's a conversation. We can have that hammered out. Also, to address the growing city and housing issues, what part of the fiscal motivation should be pledged by MOA? And further to that line, a fiscal mechanism needs to be made available to address the guarantee of repayment. And that could be some kind of interfund loan, MLP and SWS, a line of credit port, an infrastructure endowment program, the municipal cash pool, the Anchorage Telephone Trust, or unused geo bonds. We're not immediately seeing how that's going to play, but we're happy to see what comes across the transom. Bill sent this to Curtis, we'll wait and see. Okay? So, rep was playing out of the country, it took us a little while to get back together internally, but we get back together, then we get a new inquiry about the Clean Water Fund. So now Bill says he's been having conversations with Ben Sadler about the Clean Water Fund. Say, so, okay, I'm not really sure how that's going to work. Um, and we get a new email a little bit later. It says, okay, we're still very close. That's good, that's encouraging. But we think it has to come with concurrent assembly legislation that appropriates funding. And in particular, you'd like help tapping into a revolving fund at the State Clean Water Fund which I say, okay, well, we're actually very confused about this because the State Clean Water Fund makes loans, not grants. So we'll look into anything you want us to look into, but who is supposed to repay that loan? Because remember, the problem we're trying to solve is what happens if we put $28 million in the ground, you guys never buy a house, who pays back AWU? If the state clean water funds are loan programs that existing AWU ratepayers can take money from the state by way of the federal government, or rather from the federal government by way of the state, and ultimately existing ratepayers pay us back. So we put $20 million in the ground, nobody connects, the assessments are never levied, we're covered by a loan. Who's paying back the loan? AWU is paying back the loan. We haven't solved the problem. AWU is still out of its money. But okay, we'll check that out. Next thing we get, June 28th. We get a counter proposal for a draft term sheet for an interconnection agreement for AWU North Eagle River. First thing that was striking to us is that we are talking only about the water side and no longer about the sewer side. Second thing that was striking to us was in the principles of collaboration, we are now proposed to agree to one, we, the Klutna, will provide us a draft construction management contract. And then they will become sole source to construction manager on terms that we have not yet seen. That was a surprising aspect of the interconnection agreement that we did not anticipate we were going to get. What are we building? We're going to build a 24-inch water transmission main, and we're going to build the pipe in the road. That is also surprising, because we didn't know that we were talking about building the individual neighborhood water distribution line. And the sewer has totally disappeared. What does it cost? It still costs $20 million, but we have just added distribution lines. We're not sure how that math works out. Because we have distribution lines involved, there's now also a new kind of proposal. When do the distribution assessments become payable? Assuming the distribution improvement district is approved and the water project and the improvements are completed, then they get paid entirely as a lump sum or when each lot or parcel is sold by a Klugna. So the usual rule in the tariff is as soon as you're done building the pipe in the street, then the bills start becoming due. Now we have a proposal is not that regime, but after you've built the parcel and the, the pipe in the ground, only when Pete shows up and buys it from the Klutna. We can't do that under our existing tariff. And then we have this new question about how much land is even assessed for the distribution of the improvement districts, and that's a blank. I'm not sure what that's going to turn into. When are we going to build it? We'll talk about it. Who's paying for it? So we had said the improvement district pays for the transmission uh, trunk. Here, truck it must be trunk. Uh, here we have this new idea: legislative authorizations and appropriations by the municipal assembly supporting economic feasibility for AWU, which Klutna does not have to figure out, and which AWU doesn't have to figure out. Which I guess means you and I have to figure that out. And on the distribution, so really bringing home the question of who is paying. For if there's any question about that, when you get to the economic feasibility section, now we have a proposal that we are to assume that it will be economically feasible 
on the assumption that the project costs can and will be met by assembly authorization and appropriation without any money from the pollutant fund. It seems like the assessments have totally disappeared at this point. So we are really scratching our heads now, and I was looking to try to figure out how to encapsulate why we were scratching our heads. And when I was looking for a moment of clarity, I found it as I have often in the past, by looking to my favorite senior assembly member from Eagle River, who gave me the phrase Pandora's box at the last assembly meeting. So if we open our hymnals to the last assembly meeting, <laughs> remember we were talking about the Hillcrest <laughs> Improvement District, and you had Chris Tuck and other residents come say, why don't you guys flow some money into our improvement district? The wise woman said, we have water improvement districts, we have road improvement districts, we have light improvement districts for a reason. It's because we do not shift the cost to other taxpayers who do not live in them. And further, we have from a municipal standpoint, we ballot, we create a district, and it is really hard to ask people who don't live there, because if you do, it's like opening Pandora's box. And if you guys do it for Hillcrest, I promise you there are other people that are going to come hat and gloves. So get ready for Connie Yoshimura and hey, everybody else. It's kind of comparing apples and oranges, though, because as I stated, which you conveniently left off your presentation, this has been an AOS capital project before this subdivision was ever thought of for a strategic reason for AWU. So you're you're pretending like the other rate payers aren't impacted at all. I'll, I'll invite AWU to speak to that. Because I've heard AWU speak about this at many of my community council meetings, talking about redundancy and the potential need for it. speak to it, yes. Yeah, yes. So we, we don't put the Ms. Dimovsky. In theory, ASW one Yeah, I'm sorry, sir, could, could you um, please? My name is Steve Ness. I'm the engineering division director for Anchorage Water and Wastewater Utility. <laughs> So in theory, in previous master plans, we showed a whole nother redundant occlutant of water transmission main that basically went from occlutant into anchorage to provide redundancy. When we did the last iteration of the water master plan about 2012 into 2013, we got rid of that completely redundant line because it is cost prohibitive to um, manage the perceived risk. If you're going to have a water main break because of an earthquake, chances are that redundant water main will likely break because of an earthquake in the same location. What we did do within the water master plan that was most recently updated is for within powder reserves, we showed this transmission main to handle development. And it was very explicit that this transmission main was needed to accommodate proposed development within the powder reserve area. All those community council meetings, I remember specifically eight move people, and you may have been one of them, telling the community, we're not just doing this because of the neighborhood that's going to be built, we're doing this because AWU needs it. I literally heard you guys tell me to say that. What we have said is, is that our existing rate payers, the only reason AWW is considering fronting the money is because our existing rate payers do get some benefit because for that approximately two plus miles, that 24 inch line will provide additional redundancy in case there is a break between the Chudiak Vault and the North Access Vault. So there is some benefit to existing rate payers, but it's not a complete redundancy as was shown 20 years ago from No, and I wasn't implying, yeah. I was saying if there's a break in that particular area, you could go through the Chugiak Fall. But this is my point. I just wanted you guys to admit that this is how it was pitched to the community initially. Yeah, there is this isn't just time. about powder hills. I mean I've I heard that. And so I just I don't I don't wanna pretend that part doesn't exist. I wanna I wanna recognize that. Yeah, there is some benefit yeah. to yeah. our yeah. existing yeah. rate payers and that's why AWW is willing to front the money and why we know that we will likely never recoup 100% of the costs and because Steve, the people in the north won't. I think you made your point, Steve. Thank you. And the other thing I would like to just have you just confirm for me, because I've heard it too, there were a number of homeowners in this area, existing rate payers in this area, that their wells are failing. They are not existing rate payers. No, they're on wells, but they, on could, wells. they could potentially. And some people have said, uh, came up us after those meetings and said, well, even if we can't force our neighbors, can some of us get together and make our own lateral so we can hit channels? And they would pay their fair share right. of the cost of this transmission right. at the time that they do that and can. Right. So again, it's not just like one thing, like this is just the development. We do have wells that are failing in this area. And we do have, a, there would be some sort of other benefit for <coughs> redundancy in this area. All right.
right, let's sell um, And, and that's only because Chabot, and I'll say, so if that informs the conversation, the answer typically would be, AWU would pay for that with AWU cash. So if this project is 90, I don't know, 50-50, if it's 50-50, AWU would give 50% of the cash, Gutenberg would give 50% of the cash through the assessment sort of guarantee, but the taxpayers pay nothing. That's the typical arrangement. So, well, yeah, go ahead. I, I was I, just making sure, <laughs> since, since he um, was so wise to quote me, um, sure. I just wanted to make sure people realize this isn't as necessarily apples to apples what I was talking about last time. The, um, okay, let's push forward with this, and then we've got yeah, a presentation from McClutna. Yes. We do have some, we have some time, though. I know that it was, we scheduled this for two hours. I know not everybody can stay the full two hours, but for those that can, we're going to keep we're, going. We're, getting, we're all the way through June, so we're almost to the present. All right, so we received the June 20th term sheet. Our reaction is, where do the assessments go? It looks like we're no longer using improvement districts the way you normally use improvement districts, and we have departed from the 2.1.3 framework. We don't know why it's sole sourcing construction management. We're not even sure we can do that under Title VII. It doesn't address sewer. The distribution assessment trigger is illegal. And in the end, it comes with a potential 20 plus million dollar price tag because it fails. We got to pay for the transmission line. We got to pay for the distribution. So we say, let's set up a meeting. We do have a meeting. We say, look, we have these concerns. We were asked again to look into the loan funds. We said, is the concern that you're worried the assessments are too high? They said, I don't know. So we said, well, we'll give you an estimate of what the individual assessments are. So when we do our homework, I send the, the longest email I probably even sent while I've been municipal manager on August 23rd. I say, look, we're still interested in the project. Even with the we need to know where the sewer stuff went. Um, and the sewer stuff, by the way, if you just built sewer, you could probably build these projects even without starting the water solution. So the sewer is key to these developments. Uh, we looked into the water fund and we looked into the drinking fund. We don't understand how that solves the problem because somebody's got to pay that back. Uh, but in any event, even if that does solve the problem, we don't control access to those funds. Those are scored under a matrix. Here's how we think they score in the, in the project matrices. We don't think they would win, um, but if you have other thoughts about that, tell us where we have gone wrong with the math. You ask us for assessments. If we do it the way that we have agreed under 2.1.3, we think it's somewhere between 550 and 600 bucks a year if you do it over 15 years. It's a little less if you do it for longer. And, and let's get back. Ultimately, we do want this project to happen. This is a good idea. We will have lots of benefits if this project happens. But here is our take on what you sent us. We are not opposed to figuring out how something else happens. If there is another way to get this all done, we will figure out, we're happy to do it. But you guys sent us a term sheet that has suggests that the entire project cost is met by assembly authorization. And that would be great, but we do not know any scenario that is plausible in which you guys give us $20 million to do that and we have no idea where else to go for that money. <laughs> All of which is to say, let's get back to what we agreed to because we understand that process, we know it can work, doesn't depend on highly unlikely, let's find $20 million somewhere else scenarios. And that matters because we really do want to build this project. Uh, but there is an alternative. We, if we all the way back in settlement agreement, we said, if you guys want to front the money yourself and then just give us the pipe, you guys can do that. And that might be good because then you could control the construction costs, you could build a smaller pipe, it could be cheaper. It's less good from AWU's perspective because it will result in less capacity, but, but we're willing to talk about that. Can, can they build the trunk line itself? Yes. Okay, so we sent <laughs> that back, then there's a little bit of a ex very excusable delay. Curtis and I get together. James, my son, didn't have school, so he was coloring Paw Patrol in my office. We had a pretty good meeting. He says, we're going to send you a letter. He sends his letter. And the letter says, we are concerned. We're going to start working through the assembly. The improvement districts have to be flexible. <laughs> the burden of a mutually agreeing ICA falls to MOA and the assembly. So here's the letter. Your email was received with great concern. Working solely with the administration has been ineffective. Uh, and then they step through the section 2.1.3 process and they agree. We did A, B, and C. But as to D, the improvement districts should have flexible boundaries. This was confusing because we thought we had negotiated the boundaries and you guys approved the boundaries last December. Uh, and the big sticking point, the ICA allocating the upfront costs, the assembly now has a draft ICA, and some directive and policy statement. We haven't seen any of these documents. 
and the burden of a mutually agreeing ICA falls to us and you. Okay, so uh, I think, just did a quick scan, can you send us those documents? If there's another proposal, can you give it to us? And Curtis sends me to Trainee and Dunbar, so I go to those guys and I get the new drafts from Trainee, mm -hmm. and that sends us a back off to what do we do about that, and then we get the new resolution published on the addendum on November 3rd. I've been working on my response to the letter, and I, it didn't beat the new item, so I sent it on the 5th, and here's where we have left it. I did not mean to cause concern, it was certainly not the intended effect, the point of my email was we're still in it. We want to get this project done. Uh, we have diligently investigated everything you asked us to investigate, and we gave you the estimates that you asked for, but we clearly need to meet, right? I mean, we are not communicating for some reason. We are not at an impasse. We're still sort of stuck in the starting block. But here are some questions I think would help us, and I think these are the real questions of where we are at today. This would help us. We started all this by using the new tariff, the improvement district that results in assessments on the properties. Is that still where we are, or are we trying to fund the project some other way? Number two, you said the district boundaries should change. Are we scrapping the ones we have and changing the boundaries? Let us know, we're happy to work with you. Number three, where did sewer go? We sent you a draft on January 31st, we've still not heard anything on sewer. Do you guys want to proceed with the sewer stuff? And last, we sent you a private development alternative. Do you want to talk about that? You didn't respond to that, but if that's up to you. Do you want to talk about it or not? We're happy to talk. So that takes us to the resolution that gets introduced, and now we're curious to see what is the assembly documents that have been put out to the public. First, we are supposed to go chase the Clean Water Fund for loan funding. We, I think we have explored that as far as it can go. If we're wrong, we're happy to be told we're wrong, but we'll be educated and that we should enter in, we should be requested to enter into the ICA on terms that are in Exhibit A. Spoiler alert, Exhibit A is the June 28th term sheet in all material respects. So now we have a resolution that we still think is now suggesting we're out of the 2023 <coughs> framework, we're sole sourcing construction management, which I don't think you can waive Title VII with a resolution. We are still not addressing sewer, we have an illegal distribution assessment trigger, and it comes with an unstated 20 plus million dollar price tag for when this all potentially someday goes wrong. Or it can come to zero if this all works out the way we all hope it does. Okay, so I'm ending now. I'm getting to the very final end. I think the highlights here are, like I say, I don't think we're at an impasse. I think we're still in the starting blocks. We sent over the sewer pitch. We've never heard anything back. On the water side, we sent over our pitch. We met twice. We've got one counter proposal. We just need to get together and hash it out. And there are real things to hash out because we don't really even know where the alignment is yet, right? So we can work on this part of the puzzle, and we ended our last transmission with, if you're still interested in the transmission improvement district, we gotta figure out where the pipe's gonna go, because we don't wanna build it directly under Pete's future house. We wanna keep it in the street or in the greenway or something. So we would even hire you to do some of that work. With all that, I'll now leave you open for questions, but our bottom line is, I think we are still excited about bringing this project to fruition. We still think the Powder Reserve Hills and Acres project could be the first ever use of this new tariff, but we have got to get back to some reasonable understanding of how the economic feasibility or agreement guaranteeing connection or recovery is addressed for the tariff. Great. That's where I'm Thank you. All right. Prosecution rests. Yeah. Now to the, the other party. Uh, thank you, Bill. That was, I think, the longest PowerPoint in my time on the assembly. Not in a bad way, like in a lot of graphics uh, changing way. I want to hear from, before we have more questions, I want to hear from Aklutna and their presentation. I, I want to get question. everything out. I have a comment. Okay. I want to get everything out on the table, and then we can have a hash out. No, I just need to make one comment. I am so sorry, but I come to an hour work session, Me too. and I have to go to work. Me too. Okay. And so I will be squeaking out. I have as fast as I can. Um, but when I get up to leave, it's not because I'm not trying to be rude. Um, I just um, and I'm not scheduled this for two no, hours. I have a 305 I have to be at, so and I apologize to everybody. Okay, that's fine. All right, please. So uh, can you identify yourself for the record? Uh, say, 
who you are, what you're up to. Uh, Bill Starr, hmm. and I, I own a company that's been in existence for 20 years called Block 500 Development. And I also sat where you guys sat for 10 and a half years, four terms. So I have some uh, historical perspective that comes back. But it is about housing strategies and the infrastructure upgrades. And some of them will be just what you were here the first time, because there is a lot of agreement. There is a lot of understanding of where we're at. But where are we, where, why, why are we addressing it from our perspective? And that's to engage the assembly in these conversations. It's an appropriation conversation as it relates to the ICAs. Where does the money that come from? Does it balance with other projects? It's, it's entirely. It's, it's, it's time now for the assembly to hear the topics. Provide some historical information and background. Um, I have a tendency to, to, to perhaps appear arrogant, but 10 and a half years I learned a lot. Uh, some of the topics that Amy talks about, we, we, we hashed them out. We came through that. We have a growing and prosperous development uh, that's in front of us. Um, a lot of it happened on my watch. Review the infrastructure challenges and solutions. Bill's done a good job. Um, I think the, the the ever-present conversation that always comes about is, is the land shortage conversation. It's where are we going to build some of the stuff that we need, uh, whether it be public improvements, and in particular cases, all administrations come to North Anchorage. And I put North Anchorage in there uh, in, in a little satirical way. Uh, Fred Dyson would probably have you for that, but you'll see why in a little while. North Anchorage has a solution to land shortages. All the administrations come, including this one, which is, is for a couple of different reasons. One is Anchorage is full. When you look at the midtown area, look at the density, look at that. Do you remember Chief Jam? Not full. Uh, it, it's it's, it's kind of obvious from that perspective, but how do you get there and still respect the cultures? How do you still respect some of the, uh, the traditions, uh, not only that of the land use? But then how do you solve this? This was a week ago, uh, just uh, north of the North Birchwood exit. These people are all going to Wasilla. Most of them work or have shopped or have done some reason to be in Anchorage, and they're leaving in this. This happens every day. Again, they've done a good job of identifying the area, um, but I think the idea here is is how can we how can we come come together with some of this? And what happened on, on our watch with some of the more senior members and myself was completely step forward in the response and, and has done this. Can you start it up, please? What are we seeing here, Bill? Powder Reserve, Powder Ridge, and empty land uh, that, that Bill drew a lot of the lines over, uh, particularly the north. You can see the camera shots turn to the left. It's all open space. So this is existing yeah. development. Sorry, Myers is straight off the nose, and there's your empty land. These are on the other side of the highway? These particular ones, are these on, are these on the hillside? These are adjacent to the future development. Oh, okay, these are on the side. There's the future development right there. Okay. All right, I'm going to talk the fastest I've ever had because I know Amy's got to go. Um, 45 years. Don't worry, Kirk, Chris. I, I just got to cover the first 30 minutes. Okay. Something. Uh, 45 years. So, so is this Curtis McQueen? Curtis McQueen with McClure. McClure. Yeah. Thank you. 45 years since Angska. Um, City of Anchorage, every administration has come to Eklugna, the Eklugna people, and asked us to put land into play, commercial, industrial, residential. I won't go through all the history, but there's a lot of things that we've done, uh, including in the early days with that 52-inch pipe going from the lake all the way to where it is, went through Eklugna land. So irony is, and this is not anything against Awu, the village of Eklugna, where that pipe 52-inch goes right now, is not on water, is not on sewer. So there's a lot of things that we weren't as I used the word sophisticated in the early days to understand projects and say, wait a minute, we, we, we can think 20, 30 years out. Because the way we thought was trees, animals, woods, that to us was what was our infrastructure at the time. It wasn't brick and mortar and concrete. We've learned to find balance today on that. Uh, I have been with the Clutena 15 years, uh, ever since the Works Administration. Every time there's a land use plan commission, a bid goes out, a contractor gets hired, and guess what they end up doing? come out to Eklutna and they end up writing a significant piece of that report that Eklutna's lands are important, would you guys consider making it available, would you guys consider developing it, 
Uh, we have the utilities um, from, from fiber optic lines, gas lines, water lines, you name it. All infrastructure goes to include them. There are many, many neighborhoods over the years that have made up Eagle River. Eagle River is a big part of uh, Eagle River because of including the lands. Two lots sell, they sell as quick as they get developed. They, they almost develop quicker than we as a native people would like, and we have struggled with that. And in 2003, for some history, and, and I, I don't disagree with Steve, your latest comment about things, some things change, but it was AWU, it's recorded in our board minutes in 2003, came out to Klubna and pitched a concept to us well before Powder Reserve was even a concept to us about a development. Could they run through this parcel of land and connect to the Chugat High School. They were in our board meeting, they explained the need for the redundancy, we asked a lot of questions, everything from forest fires, to more water, to water pressure. Some of the recent solutions for AWU is to start building water tanks over by Fred Meyer. So there's an acknowledgement in this area of town that more water pressure, more water is important. And it wasn't just for housing. Um, that conversation happened, we were, we were in Powder Ridge. We have built Powder Ridge since 2000, to 2012, 340 homes, full. So much interest after that. Uh, and again, each administration engaged the conversation. It was never a Klutna's idea. It wasn't our concept to start doing Powder Reserve. It was the city coming to us and saying, housing, housing, housing. It was also the builders. Uh, we don't build homes. We supply inventory to builders, of course, the real estate community, all of that. Eagle River is a very popular place. We've also had a joint base Elmendorf. I wish they were in the room today. Jay Bear has also asked us to uh, have infrastructure because after John Rabini and Davis Constructors did their last housing project on Jay Bear, Jay Bear doesn't want to have any more housing. They want training lands. Even though we're old land, Nala, I won't get into that, Eagle River has become a very important place for the military. 30% of the people that live in our existing developments are military. So uh, the misnomer, that uh, in 30 years we would not be uh, lots wouldn't be built we can't Eagle River can't keep up uh, right now I mean so we went ahead and, and as, an, as a native people and I Tim Potter really challenged us to think way down the road challenged us with master planning and Tim said you guys you, you've met with the city you've met with administrations uh, the Eagle River Chamber, Susie Gorski, I can go on and on. Everybody asked us to consider developing this. The other reason is that downtown Eagle River, the main thoroughfare that runs through the main part of downtown Eagle River, there's no more developable land, so business, commerce. So the idea was if Eklutna would open up its mind and consider starting to develop on the other side of the highway, it would be a place for the community to grow, Eagle River. So we had all these things come at us. Uh, and yet we had some tribal folks in the village that were concerned about habitat. So, to back to Tim Potter, the first drawing we got did not have high density. In 2006, we went in front of planning and zoning, we went in front of the assembly, we met with the community councils, and we ended up doing a master plan. And all it was was single family lots. We also challenged ourselves that although we could have done up to uh, 2,040 lots at the time, we're people of bears, wolves, habitat, wetlands. And so we took 100 acres out of play in this development so that we could look at the tribe, look them in the eye and say, yes, we're gonna help the market grow, but we're not um, discounting the fact that there's some wonderful habitat. That's why you don't see this completely full. Yes, there's wetlands there, but we own so many wetlands we could mitigate. We could develop in our wetlands and offset that. We chose to have a development which differentiates Eagle River and the Birchwood Chugiak area from Anchorage, which is not sitting on top of each other. More reports started coming out, and we were asked to change our master plan to consider density. Um, you have a lot of military folks that are stationed here for three years. You have new home buyers that can't afford a single family lot. You have retired people who want to downsize. So, because of the community requests, because of multiple mayors, because of multiple city managers, because of multiple, we started to change this. Mike Abbott was with the school district and then he came to us and Debbie Osiander had, had a commitment from Mike Abbott that they would do a new school site. So the school district came to us. It wasn't our idea, but they said, would you consider taking some lots out 
and putting a school site in. And so they acquired the site. Of course, we saw synergy with families coming in. It would make sense to have a school there. So we were doing that. Anna Faircloth, who now is Anna McKinnon, Section 25 up above us, there were discussions about big parks. So we have always thought about this from a global uh, big picture. MEA came to us and said, well, if you're going to build that, we need a new <coughs> station. Eagle River came to us and said, well, could you put some commercial? If we're going to grow the town over to this area, would you at least put some commercial, some coffee shops, all that? So this is the latest master plan right here, which shows single family residential multi-density, multi-family, school site, MEA substation, uh, commercial site, green belt, and wetlands. This is a clue. It's a very balanced approach that we think uh, we're coming at it. With AWU, um, we've got a timeline, and uh, I really appreciate uh, Brett's leadership, and we've got a couple team members here. Um, there's persons not here, but Brian Boss, we work with AWU and a team of folks. Many have retired since we worked. Our meeting started with AWU in 2014. AWU asked us if we would start holding weekly meetings with them, and they created a big team. I created a team, and we were doing that. And in those meetings, I want to correct something about the construction. In those meetings, we said, if we own all this land and we know where the lots are, we want to participate in not only possibly project management of this, but we would also like to consider going out on the street, trying to get this price down, and maybe even even participating as a contractor. In those meetings, for several years, the tone and tenor of those meetings was, yes, good idea, we'll do that together. In those meetings, the tone and tenor was, we'll go find the money together. Dramatic shift in the fall of August, and hence the impasse, and I think Bill and I and the mayor, I think we can work this out. But why did the Clutha start pulling away? There was a shift in some face-to-face -face meetings. Not in all, you don't see me putting up emails and stuff, and I, I, it's all accurate. There were meetings behind closed doors, and the tone and tenor in those meetings completely changed. And we got confused, because for 15 years, we have been asked to do this. For 15 years, we've been told this is gonna be good for the overall anchorage. For 15 years, and all of a sudden, last August in 2017 is, oh no, this is just for you guys. Oh no, this is just for Pluto. Oh no, you know, we can't put the burden of cost on other people. And so we thought, well, let's start talking to the mayor and administration because when they came in, they said the greater good. That shifted. So I think what's happened is the technical bean counter negotiating side has gotten so focused on that that we're confused by what happened to this 50,000 foot level conversation that for 45 years, 15 years has been coming at us. And we got really frustrated. And our board felt like, well, oh, and I'll add one other thing. The administration has said, talk directly to us. Work this out with us. So we tried. We are trying. I don't want to say that there's been a complete failure. But if you look at all the significant things that has been wonderful about what the Muni and the Clutin has done, it's been through the assembly process. You look at the overlay district where this, where the assembly celebrated the culture by protecting the village. You look at the tactical training center. We did that. There is institutional knowledge that's changed with the administration. There's institutional knowledge that's lost with employees leaving and new ones coming on. We're a literal people. That logo of the city, that logo, we look at that logo and we make a commitment to that logo. And, and it doesn't matter who comes and goes, we make a commitment to that logo. And when that logo changes its commitment on us, we retract. We get confused because it makes no sense. And hence, that's been some of the frustration that is, has bled through. So I, I guess you hear the emotion, you hear, you hear the progress. I re-enter here to talk about how can we overcome this. And we have a common goal here. These folks here, I will compliment the AWW commitment. One of the things that you recognize quickly with the AWD network, right, when you when you look at both the combined sewer and water divisions, it's highly complicated. They do things here in this community that, that no other state has to deal with. Um, reservoir, transmission lines, the whole gamut. Um, they warm the water at the new Sullivan plant so the water doesn't freeze. When you dig into these layers, these guys react to all of that from a highly technical 
and, and a tremendous um, sense of their responsibility to serve it. So nowhere in here is, is that whole sense of it. This is awkward for us in particular to have this he said, she said type of arrangement, but it is time to have those conversations of what is a policy call, where does the assembly uh, dial into the fiduciary responsibility thereof. And as you do that, I would suggest these things. Um, I would look to these as resource maps and, and roadmap tools. The AWW master plan, which is effective in 2012, should be one of those vital roadmap um, conversations. We have, as Bill talked about, the methane gas settlement agreement, the tariffs, the TUDF, you can work the comprehensive plan, uh, which you which you referred to, and then the IC is well, there's a lot of similarities, a lot of common ground here, but the the, the way you get to the obstacle and, and the overcoming, uh, we see it differently, and we see it probably from a, a, a greater uh, 50,000 foot more historical level. Uh, when you dig into the AWW master plan and the 2012, which was a, which is a, um, um, approved by the assembly, by the way, the, the assembly sees that master plan and approves it in 2012. It was approved, you, you see a series of projects, and this is where that, um, that in quotes came from, from the northern communities. That's what AWW projects reference. So when you see a northern community, you're thinking of Chugiak, Eagle River, and north. So the northern community project listings are in this guiding document. The, the 2012 um, roadmap talks about Project 1160, which is Terrace Lane, or IE, known as the Powder Reserve Transmission Loop. Uh, project number 1164 is a land purchase in a water storage uh, project. Project uh, 1214 talks about that with funding and anticipated costing uh, uh, policies as well embedded in the 2012 master plan. So this is a really uh, good uh, concept because it does more than just address the housing, fire safety issues, water <coughs> volume and pressure issues. How do you deliver it to new ratepayers? How do you afford it? There's really uh, a guiding sense in there so that rather than, than have bedtime reading and following plan, just get, get into the elements that relate to your decision making for the day and that'll, that'll guide you as a good roadmap. So the projects 1160, 1164, 1214, and others, but they all revolve around the, the benefits that we all have. And this, these leaders, such as yourselves back in the day, were really smart. Bill's identified, <coughs> we are lucky to have this. This is a 54 inch transmission main uh, that starts at the Kutna Reservoir. It flows by gravity. Um, <coughs> And down, down the routing, and, and it's in a, interesting to you know, Bill showed it on his maps. The 54 inch transmission line crosses the property that you guys are talking about in this part of the case. It's right here. It goes right through there. But it doesn't stop there, it doesn't end there. It brings the water into Anchorage. So, gravity fed uh, comes through the settling solution tanks up in the Eagle uh, River Treatment uh, Facility up by uh, Kapluka, and then continues on past. The designers um, back in, in the day were smart. They put in vaults, they put in offshoots that said, hey, here's where we think we're gonna need to tap into the water. The volume and the pressure, uh, the design, the construction back in the day, you can't just tap in anywhere on this. That's the first thing we gotta recognize is it's not a solution to say, well, shoot, just put one right here. That doesn't work. What you're prescribed to is the, is the vaults. There's one at the Chugiak High School's exit, which is uh, the uh, North Birchwood, uh, excuse me, the South Birchwood turnoff. And there's the next one occurs here uh, at the North Eagle River exit, and there's scattering ones all the way into town. There's, I believe, 11 of them. Is that? Yeah, there's 11 vaults, large vaults, where the 54 inch line is stepped down. What's happened, and has been identified throughout the projects that we see, um, is, is back to these topics the water safety, or excuse me, water pressure, fire safety, delivery to new ratepayers. But 1160 starts to address that for various reasons. It's been in the book, it's been in there since at least 2012, and it does just what Bill references. It talks about a proposed transmission loop line, 24 inch. There's a sample of it right there. Whether it would be that production or that, it, it, the evidence part is that size. And what it does, in theory, and, and again, we can challenge all day whether it's necessary for the development here only, or does it serve a greater good. It takes the water bypass and it bypasses it from this fault to this fault, and there's a lot of benefits to that. Do you get water volume and water pressure and all the water needs for, for uh, the equipment development? You certainly do, but you get other things. You get the fire safety element, that, that, that there will be fire hydrant pressure that, that will make sense out there. There'll be additional water volume. You can only get so much through a 24 inch pipe. So one of the technical challenges is when it, when it downsizes from 54 to 24, you can only squirt so much water through that. This vault is tapped. That's why they're coming to include and saying, and I don't think they would deny it if you asked them, 
they're not they're denying they don't have the water volume service area because this is too restricted. The pipe is restricted. So back to the solution that they presented, take the loop line, increase the volume. <coughs> as a paraphrase, it may be. But it also does and it talks to other topics that are definitely in, in the current plan and starting to come about, which which is back in, in my day and in, in your world of what you're facing. Mr. Welton, you're dealing with it down in Girdwood. You're seeing water storage issues, uh, water tanks. I think this assembly uh, just approved a purchase uh, from Heritage Land Bank to, to buy a site right here at McFarland Center to put in new water storage tanks because they don't have the water volume. Uh, even in their own report, it talks about two concurrent fires at the same time. The water volume, water pressures uh, could be questionable whether or not we have enough volume to try to keep it centered. So the benefits reach far behind just housing. It addresses the water pressure needs, and of course it does talk about the housing solution, the expanded power to the school site. Uh, they're all going to need water volume, which they don't have this one. That solution brings it brings it together. It, it's a combination. This solution solves a lot of problems. I don't think there's any rub at that. Same conversation with who built it. Who built it, all the things that Bill identifies, who pays for it, when does it get done, and all of that's really important. But again, the history of, of the conversation needs to be brought forward. And Bill did a pretty good job with that. Some of you guys that are on the system, and particularly in other parts of Anchorage, you've never heard of NALA. I, 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 I venture to say you probably haven't. It was new to me when I joined, quite honestly. Uh, NALA was formed uh, in a 1982 agreement when ANILCA came online, and I'll paraphrase a little bit, there's a lot to it, but when ANILCA came online, there was a, dis a, a disagreement in, in who had the rights for various parcels of, of land. I think it's referred to as topping or uh, when there's, Top land. Yeah, there, there's several people that say, hey, we want that. And it went on and on and on. The North Anchorage Land Agreement settled a, a, a discussion between the MLA, the military, and the, and the folks over, uh, okay, well, uh, let's agree to disagree, essentially, is what it said. But it did it did have a prescribed um, a set of terms and conditions in there. And, and this, is the, this, is, this is what led to the methane gas settlement agreement. One of the clauses in the, in the NALO conversation talks about the rights and opportunities for if you ever do something with the land of question, such as make money with it or give it to somebody else, a clue has to have a, have, has a say in that. So what happened was, in part, um, it was started because in the baggage administration, they essentially gave a sole source kind of, uh, right to the methane gas to Doyon Corporation. And it, it was probably not a bad idea. I think it was a great idea. Doyon, in turn, built a, a turbine generation system that captures the methane <coughs> gas and produces electricity. They sell to the traders. Occluden was left out of that conversation. It happened on my watch. Some of it I take responsibility for. It was uncomfortable. It led to a lawsuit. Jump forward, passed the Sullivan administration. Couldn't get an agreement, couldn't have a conversation. It was going through the courts. I believe it was all the way to the Superior Court. And it ended up in Superior Court. The city was on the hook, probably. Whether they're going to win or lose, who knew? It settled out. It settled out of court. That was great. Um, Mr. Traney, if he's online, he took, he took the lead, pushed that through. That settlement came, uh, came to be. And I give credit to, the, to Mayor Berkowitz for seeing the light. He, he said, let's, let's get out of this. Uh, Five million dollars came to include that. By the way, of which two million is setting in an escrow account until this is all sorted out. So uh, whether or not including got rich on the conversation or was there free dollars, free capital? Well, I don't think so. They were entitled to it by now. But part of the settlement agreement, the methane gas settlement agreement, or MGSA as I call it later, uh, talks about um, this. This is where it was first introduced in the settlement agreement uh, by the Berkeley administration. It says here, we're introducing the expansion of housing supply. It caught me off guard too, but it kind of makes sense. It's like, all right, what's our skin in the game? Our skin in the game is, all right, we, we, we messed up now, but let's get some housing in, into the mix. So we did it. Um, the Metro Gas Settlement Agreement bill referenced some of these sections. It's in your packet, by the way. Um, I gave you a copy of it. In section 2.1 is where Bill talked about it. So your, your packets have the methane gas settlement agreement. So, so we picked various high points. Absolutely, we picked the high points um, that are important. It's all important because it's happened. It's over. You guys don't have to deal with that. You have to deal with the ramifications of, of the methane gas settlement agreement as it comes to the binding agreement of that. And there's 2.2. It does talk about the same things that Bill talked about. We're in agreement here. It's 45 housing units. 
in Powder Acres. It's the 63 house in, in Powder Hills. Um, and again, part of the conversation was the mayor had to make a public apology on behalf. In this case, he really manned up. I, 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 that was an emotional conversation for him to have. Was a mistreatment of the Occlumen Corporation, the Native peoples, or whatever. He did a great job. He did it at AFN, of all places. The mayor really stepped into the, into the situation and the solution. Now it's getting it's getting the job done. One of the conversations is where is the assembly named in the, in the in methane gas settlement agreement? And Bill touched on it. 2.14 talks about, and you can read it, I could read it to you, but it basically says it's all for naught unless you guys appropriate the money. So it basically says, you know, it's all pending future legislation, future appropriations. The assembly's got to do something. And it also says sole discretion. You do come into that. We emphasized, and the, the divergence was the fact that Bill gave you a conversation that's very complicated. He talked about basically tariff section 8. Tariff section 8 was modified, no question. I modified it. Some others on the assembly moved and changed the language to allow flexibility as it relates to the, to the districts. Uh, the tariff is also in your, in your, in your packet. We've decided that tariff section 8, and I say we've decided, it, it's, it's unclear as to how it happens, but tariff section 8 is a much cleaner and more effective way of, of I, I believe, answering the question. And so it is our, our opinion, and I say ours. Julia Tucker works with me. She's contracted with my company. Julia understands this stuff. She was here when we modified the tariff. And there's no time to modify Section 10. Section 10's been in there for eons. It's been, been approved. So the section agreement, uh, text, Section 10 talks about extension agreements and contracts, particularly water infrastructure coordination agreements. So under 10.3 of the tariff, which there's a copy in your packet, it says to do several things. And, and here's the criteria that, that Bill sort of referred to in 8. 10 has a 2. But if you're going to enter into an infrastructure coordination agreement, meaning who pays for what and how does it get built. It's this agreement that does it with very fixed criteria. This is why we like Section 10. 10.3e says that the infrastructure agreement has to meet these criteria. It doesn't say it in 8, it says it in 10. So when you're talking about the ICA tariff agreements, you're going to look at these criteria. And again, they're fairly specific. General manager's discretion, utility can pay for it, obviously, Proposed infrastructure is consistent with the master plan. Um, you know, all the appropriate uses of, of the land is appropriate for what we're talking about. Operational financial benefit to the utility and ratepayers. This could be a policy call right here. But when you measure the ICA that's it's currently part of your legislative approval packet, it's got these criteria. And whenever you can have specific criteria to say yes, 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 <coughs> yes, it does. It's great. And it, it will be a spar just a little bit. The ICA agreement that AWW brought us has a lot of other stuff in it. It doesn't measure up against the criteria that's right here. This is the criteria, not the other things. So those could be done by different types of agreements, private development agreements, subdivision agreements, uh, utility agency agreements. You need to get the high horse here and get the ICA done by this criteria. That's all there is. We're, we're not paraphrasing. It's a three-page tariff. Ten is easy to read. As, as Bill affectionately call them the blue people, you do have to watch out for the neighborhood concerns. Stay off the third rail. Um, and, and those that were on the assembly body um, got paraphrased by a meeting that Amy and I went to. Brett Jocko was there. 300 people with pitchforks. They said, really, respect our plans. Respect where we're at. And the neighborhood concerns are these. This is the Eagle River Comprehensive Plan. Another learning moment for you is that Chugiak Eagle River has its own comprehensive plan. It's not bound by Anchorage 2020. It's not Anchorage. So Eagle River Chugiak has had its comprehensive plan, and it gives clear guidance in there as to where you can extend these services and what you should do. So guidance is to stay off the third rail, but it talks specifically about powder reserve and some of these areas where the uh, water improvement lines will go. Again, these are tools and, and uh, assistance items to you guys to, to stay off the, the topics uh, that are challenging and get to the roadmap that will let you have a solution. Affectionately known as blue people. Bill decide, talked about them as well. They don't want water and sewer north of the powder reserve. I think that's the answer is respect the boundaries, follow the Chugiak Eagle River Comprehensive Plan guidance, and then look at the, at the no water solution past the powder reserve. That doesn't mean that the infrastructure can't go through there, it's just don't make them look up. Stay away from that. 
this is the other challenge, and again, not the debate on the floor right now, but when you look at section 8.3, it starts the argument, it pushes that argument to assessments, it talks about all those things that are messy. Tariff 10 doesn't do that, it stays away from it. This is what lights those people on fire up there, is that they feel like they're being assessed, even though you don't hook up, you still have a lien on your title, and that's a frustrating conversation you know, to try to get over. So, Look at, at, the, at the tools of, of the trade, the infrastructure coordination agreement. Again, in, in the inference that, that Bill has where the friction's coming from, they're startled and stunned. This is the way it's been done forever. He started his presentation by, hey, you guys get to be part of the first time ever. Don't go there. Don't go to the first time ever. That's a 24-inch trunk and transmission size right there in front of you. AWW and in most cases, the upper hillside cases, all this stuff has paid for that type of infrastructure. For a couple reasons, is the common man can't hook up into that. You can't hook your house up to that pipe. You need to have the smaller pipes, the ones next to it. That's the other side of it. So in this particular case, let the transmission, the trunk, whatever you want to call it, backbone main, everybody needs to get cognizant of their definitions. Transmission, trunk, backbone main. And some of my confusion, I'll take credit for it, was the definitions were hard to hard to bring under one conversation because they evolve over time. When you see a, a pollutant or a AWW's language in their in their 2012 plan and how that equates to the projects that, like 1160, they call it different things themselves. So the confusion is that there shouldn't be any confusion in this thing to get more water volume to solve some of the problems, including the housing market issue, bring some more volume from there to here. That's an AWW infrastructure conversation, easily satisfied um, by funding. Let the distribution water pipes, the small ones, be paid for by the developer. That's how it's done now. When, when a developer comes and says, we want to build this, they go to the planning department, the planning department comes up with a private subdivision agreement or just a subdivision agreement that says, all right, here's where your pipes go, here's the quality that you build it. When you're done building it, we'll come and inspect it. All those developers build all that stuff, those small pipes in particular, bring all those lines into the marketplace, they, de they develop them themselves, they pay for all that, and then they give it to a pollutant, or to a AWW. So the idea that those distribution lines um, aren't a contribution to the AWW network, but fine, that's how customers hook up. And then, of course, the AWW charges the 90 to $110 an hour. I want to digress just per, per hour, per month, I should say for their water hookups. A lot of you guys are on AWW service. The reason you don't hear us talking about the ICA agreement for the sewer is it's a different solution. Bill identified it. It's two different projects. AWW is split at the RCA level in two different tariffs. There's a tariff for the water side and there's a tariff for the sewer side. In these particular chapters, they're not drastically different. However, we feel that the solution is going to be different. It's going to take another ICA to solve the sewer problem. It's a different solution altogether. It's a different conversation. It's a different technological solution and a different outcome. It doesn't affect those people on the north. It's a different price tag, all the other things. So just to get that on the record, the ICA and the conversation with the sewer, we feel it's easier to solve. Again, back to the conversations. Let, let the developer pay for those distribution service lines, the blue things, and then you have a, then you have a combined system. And it looks like that. 54 inch water line, whatever routing you choose for the trunk, uh, trunk and transmission line, and then your distribution lines come in under the payment uh, thereof. That's what the ICA is in your packet. That's what that summarizes. That's what attachment A is attached to the legislation that Mr. Training and Dyson and Ms. Dombowski have got in front of you. Where do you go with the future and leadership? Been there, done that a little bit. This is a hard one. I mean, it's a complicated topic, a little bit of emotion involved. Back in the day, folks, it was easy. You just called up your city or your state legislator and said, hey, we need 10 million bucks for a pipeline. And you got it. However, is that is that really what a growing community needs to rely on is you know, daddy war bucks, or can we do it through appropriate? I feel it's pain. Brett's got a lot of challenges here with deteriorating infrastructure. You read the 2012 report, a lot of this stuff in the ground is 32 years old. Do you fix it first, or do you, do you where's the balance? And there, there's the conversation that also is a policy calls What's your contribution going to be? Reaching out to all these sources. I'll, I'll, I'll hit on a few other things after I give you a little bit of my wisdom guidance because this is really where it's at. So what's your policy on infrastructure development? Who pays for what? Where does it come from? 
just I think you have to respect the traditions and the history of, of what's always been done. Answer these questions. Does it augment a larger system? Does it get benefited? Does it serve the greater good? Does it motivate the growth and community investment? Is it fair, equitable, and set the correct precedent? Will you do this somewhere else? Will the solution for here will it also work in Girdwood or wherever else those growing communities are faced? You, know, you have to have the assembly awareness of the fiscal note. There's no question about that. It's your job. It's when you're elected as a policymaker. The fiduciary responsibility is primary. They adhere to the master plans, uh, align with the, uh, the capital improvement pledges, the GO bonds, the state programs. We, we take st state and federal money all the time. We realize your long term goals on the investment. That's really it. I think what I wanted to describe to you in the packets is a couple pieces of information that I thought were helpful. The priority in the ranking list for the Clean Water Fund. You guys tap into it all the time. I would venture to say you probably tap into clean water funding uh, projects um, 20 times this year. I don't know right, how often you guys go to that fund. It is a revolving fund. The money primarily comes from the EPA uh, to the state. The EPA has given guidelines by, quite frankly, who's ever president. Back in the day, it was, it was Mr. Obama. President Obama was, was uh, green solar solutions, renewable energies. You saw criteria measures that said uh, do that. There was also the inference of fix it first, no question. So you see those little headers. What you have in there is the packet notes uh, for what's in what's in play. And here's what it demonstrates is AWW hasn't even asked yet on this project. They haven't put their request in there to say that. So the, the inference that it's going to score a certain point. But what I really want to note is that is look at the top highlighted line in your very packet. You don't have to read it now, but later. Read that very, there, there's more money in the fund right now than people have applied for. The second quarter project requests are in, and the note on the top of that thing says, we'll consider all other projects because we still have money left over. That's vital. The financial position of AWWU, a great job, right? You're, ma you're managing it. There's cash for both construction, for operations, for that. There, there certainly is that. But look at the cash flow. Is there more that you could fund this right out of cash? Those are your calls. I, I, I'm glad I don't have to face some of them, quite frankly. Um, will we continue to work together? You guys need to be involved. You need to tell us what ICA makes sense. Uh, where does it go? Are you going to compare and contrast certain elements of that? We've tried all of that. You have an ICA in your packet that the cash is, is, is an exhibit A by those legislators that meet the criteria and the goals. That's that's our position. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. I, I, okay. I just want to clarify one thing because the 20 million, 28 million has been thrown around. I want to give some realistic numbers because we as a corporation, we are very transparent. The one thing in that Birchwood meeting we clarified that most people finally understood is we pay our way. When there's an infrastructure in there, we hook into it. We take loans out from banks, we pay those loans off when those lots sell. Just to give you a sense, 1,500 homes. And we predict that this, including in the slowest time the market was, we were selling lots and it's picking up. We feel that this is a 12 to 20 year build out. So the 30 years and 40 years of if nothing was there that should come back and include us, we think that's a moot point. Just with ABU, if you just took the $100 water bill at 1,500 homes, that's $150,000 a month. Uh, that's $1.8 million a year. Over 20 years, that's $36 million that they would collect just off hooking up to the water lines. If you take the property tax, which every administration has told us the reason they want us to do this is back to Bill's pictures of the cars. People are moving to the valley because they're getting lots out there. They're getting bigger lots. We have a lot of people that when we develop, we get people who move from the valley back into Anchorage. If you just do property tax with today's numbers, if this development was done on an annual basis, that's $9,874,000, uh, $9,874,000 to the city, that's $223,822,000 in 20 years. In 40 years, that's $447,644,000. So if you take 20 million and we think it's less than that. Whatever that cost is for what the city gets in property tax, ABLE gets back in its water bill, let alone you get those people back. We bought into all the city economists saying, if we do this, a lot of those cars won't go by. So we're willing to do that. What does it cost us? I want to be clear on that, that we make money selling a lot, but not what people think. Right now it costs us and we could probably get more efficient. We're new at building, uh, meaning that Clinton has only been doing it for 20 years. About $75,000 a lot is what it cost us. If that entire development is done, you're looking at about $112,500,000. 
in debt and things we would take on. Obviously, we would do it in phases. We can't even afford that, so we would do it in phases. But we've already proved in Powder Ridge, we did that in eight phases, literally in nine years. What would we make? And today, we've made $50,000 a lot. So we would make about $75 million to include the corporation over the life of if all that filled out. Now, what does that mean? Our shareholders aren't always focused on money. Now, I've got a lot of pressure of not developing this. So it's one and done for us. What would we get if this was done? $75 million over 20 years. What would the city get? Add up the $36 million for AWU, add up the $447,000. The disparity of math is so, I just want to make this very clear that we pay our way. We're not getting rich off of this. We've been doing this because of all the pressure from the community and there seems to be, and I don't want, I'm not gonna go as far as using the word spin, but back to our frustration is the tone and tenor in the fall of 2017 changed from, we all want you to do this to, this is for you. And that's not fair to us. And so the other thing is, again, our relationship with assemblies are important to us. We have assembly members that have reached out. I went to a meeting on the new seal. And when I was asked to come to that and I sat at the table, the first question that came at me from Mr. Trainee was, where are you in Abu? Where are you in the city on this project? I was very diplomatic. I was very polite, Joe, just like you were today. I was frustrated, but I didn't vent that. I was surprised that that was the question came up. The other question was, the assembly should have a work session. Curtis, would you show up? have that. We're here today to be able to answer questions. So I hope you've taken some of the bigger picture, the mystery, the backstory out. I respect the technical angle of it, but you're talking to the equipment denying it. Life is a lot more than technical. It's, it's social, it's cultural, and we are stepping up. And today, right now, we own this land outright, and today it's probably about a $30 million value undeveloped. That is our checkbook right now we're willing to put into this project. We spent $1.3 million to do this master plan and all the different things over the last 10 years. We have been spending money, we have Triad in the room, a very respectful engineering firm that has done a lot of work with ABU. I have spent money with them. We are spending money today. So I want to get away from this perception that this is all benefiting us, we're either greedy or something we're not contributing. I would argue we've contributed a lot more than, uh, than people realize. So I just want to get that out there, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be in front of you guys today. Thank you, Curtis. Uh, we have a number of questions, a pretty long queue here, Eric, John, Austin, Amy. Uh, but I, I wanted to start with a question, a sort of big picture question. So I mean, I, I do hear from both sides, this is a project, both sides have said it's a project we want to see go forward. This is something that we are in agreement on, that ultimately this benefits us both if it happens. It seems like the, the two biggest issues right now are the upfront capital and the risk. Th those to me seem like the largest, the largest issues. And I get so my question is I, I have a couple of specific questions. The first is to the Klutna folks on the Clean Water Act because it is specifically in what you presented to us. So if it's a loan, what's the appeal if it's if it's a loan rather than a grant, a, as has been stated? Um, and then for the city, what is the harm in just asking for it? I mean, maybe it's not what we put our, maybe we don't put our eggs in that basket, but why not at least ask for it? So th those are those are the questions I want to start with. So, yeah, AWWs on the debt hooks are for about four hundred million. Yeah, so they borrow often from that fund, and, and a good portion of that money uh, that goes into that fund, it's a revolving fund. First off, it's very very low interest, so. Essentially, it's project specific. So, to answer your question, it, it, it's low, low debt uh, to interest. There's, there's not a lot of it. So, the idea that it's a working pool of cash uh, is fairly common. So, the ratepayers now for the monies that have been borrowed for other projects <coughs> against that fund, those ratepayer dollars through the AWU's payments, uh, really go back in and re, re, you know, repay that revolving fund. So, it's very common. It's also done. Like I said, you guys have probably done it 20 times this year and your funding sources on that. So it's a very common source to go back to. And and what I will say in, in a way that might have some friction is that you, you shouldn't be picking and choosing your projects because of what might happen. To answer your question uh, from our perspective is there really isn't any harm in, in, in putting it in the project if it ranks low 
fine, but in this particular case at the moment, there's more money in the fund than projects have been asked for. So the state has dollars available. Okay. Would that position change? I don't know. Thank you, Bill. Now I'd like to hear a response to that from Mr. Falsi and or Mr. Jokula. I'd like to repeat Bill in this conversation. Yeah, a lot of bills. Uh, what is the harm in applying for the loan fund? First, I guess there's no harm other than it would take some effort to put it in an application. But we don't need the loan fund to build the project. We have the cash. We've programmed the cash. We're ready to go if we get an ICA done. So the problem that is not yet solved is what happens if we put $28 million in the ground, the project doesn't come to fruition, who then pays AV back because Pete never showed up? The loan doesn't solve that problem. But if the loan if the loan is very low interest, you know we have this capital money already our own, but that that is precious. That's something we hold, right? If we got a very low interest loan and use that to put in the ground, then it's true we're still on the hook, but we're on the hook for a very low interest payment for a very long time potentially. Right, but somebody still has to pay that back, and we are, we don't yeah. control it. I mean, the, maybe some of the experts can speak to it. If you want to have a separate discussion about, uh, we can talk through the matrix and show you. How we think the project scores. Well, I, I, if we think it's wrong. We that that to me is less interesting. That to me is but, less interesting than would it effectively lower our risk to use that low interest loan? No. Okay. No. And then, and, and ultimately, the harm that we perceive is needless delay because we don't think it advances the project at all. And we can we will chase down whatever people ask us to chase down, but we're trying to get it done. We thought we would be at ICA balloting like two months ago when we sent over our proposal January. So we can take a look at it. We, we investigated it once. Steve, I don't know if you have anything about that. Okay, hold on, hold on. Let's. I uh, want Brett. Could you speak, and then Curtis? I'd like to, to have Steve course. just give us a real quick overview of the process for putting the, the loans together. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's very brief, after a project is underway, okay. uh, and as Bill has said, this is not a funding uh, uh, opportunity; it's a financing opportunity, and that doesn't seem to be. I will just tell you real quick, the loan is a non-issue. Ignore the loan for this regard. We apply for loan funding on almost every single project that's over $500,000. I have no problem applying for the loan. Whether or not it scores well is besides the point. Yeah. If you look at the list that Mr. Starr gave you, you will see a predominant number of projects that are AWWU. $174 million over the last 10 years we've taken from ADEC on state revolving fund loan. We use loan money wherever we can get it because it is low interest. If we get it here or if we don't get it here, we can still apply. We will apply. There's the priority list in the planning list. It's a non-issue in terms of the actual discussion. It goes back to it's still a loan. It's not a guarantee of payment. There is less risk. That's the bottom. Okay. Well, great. Then we've come to an agreement that we can at least apply even if we decide that that doesn't, isn't actually dispositive. Curtis, did you want to say something? No, I, I think this is a great conversation, and, and uh, Bill Stark can correct me. There was a meeting behind both doors that we had uh, that we took away, and you used the word misunderstanding, so maybe I'll put it to this. As it went from we can do this to we don't have the money, so we started to think, well, maybe we can help. Maybe maybe there's a way. Meaning, A, we did city didn't have the money. Again, we look at the logo of AWO in the city as one. And so we were looking for creative ways to say, where could you find the money? What I'm hearing today is, no, the money's there. So that may be okay. um, Great. Thank you, Chris. Now let's go into the questions from my colleague. We'll start with Eric, and then John, then Austin. Mr. Member, can I just beg my assembly members to jump the queue because I got to go. Okay. That's fine. Um, go ahead. I will listen to the rest of the discussion. I just want to make a couple of comments. Um, I have to tell you, when I read the agreement in January, I was floored because I felt like I was put in a position not only um, by ABU but by the city to quell the fears. I'm the one who led the meeting with 300 people that were very upset. And time after time after time, ABU went out of their way to tell the residents in my community, we're not doing this for a Putna. Yes, they're going to be a beneficiary, but this has been in our capital plan, and this is what we we need. This this is redundancy, and so when I sat here today, I did not confirm this. I did not know what presentation you were going to give. I haven't talked to you about this at all, and so my initial reaction was one of, wait a second, there's a big element missing here because this isn't how it was pitched to my community, and to me, I think it's a big deal 
when now I'm hearing the administration say, well, this is to benefit a pollutant in this development, because I wasn't there. I, I, I wasn't there for that. I was there for all the other stuff when they were telling me that was a per peripheral benefit, a substantial one, but a benefit. But secondly, every single time we sat there in front of those rate payers, we sat in front of that, well, they weren't rate payers yet, we sat in front of those people that were gonna be balloted to potentially vote on this, they, they kept saying, how are you going to pay for this? What are you going to do? And AWU kept saying over and over and over, everybody's going to be assessed. Don't worry about it. You'll be levied upon connection. A pollutant is going to pay their portion. When they hitch up, as soon as this happens, as soon as those lines are done, those distribution lines, they're going to be paying. And so I'm just really shocked at this whole conversation has turned to, well, who's going to pay for it now? Because the pitch I heard over and over, and I probably even haven't reported, frankly, the pitch I heard over and over again was, we have these assessments, you're gonna go through this way, and um, you know, it was not really an issue. So I, I'm just perplexed by the way this has completely gone off the rails, and I don't think it's necessary. I think everybody wants this to happen, but I will tell you, for me, where this failed was when I first saw the agreement come out of AWU, and it said basically, oh yeah, we had all these discussions about we're gonna have these assessments, everybody's been responsible, and that damn agreement said, oh, by the way, the clue you're on the hook for the whole thing. That's where it went off the rails for me. And that's why you see my name on this today. It's because I'm frustrated by what has happened. And I don't know why it happened, frankly. I mean, but for me to be the person who led all these discussions in front of 300 angry people, because, and we went through all these hoops, and I think Bill's done a great job of trying to quell the, the concerns about being forced to hedge up. You know, um, so from that perspective, I think uh, we've done everything we can, but there's this little sticky widget that all of a sudden, I don't know where this torpedo came from, and it is that it, right there to me is the is the defining moment right there. If you're going to make a woo say they have to be on the hook for this entire thing, it's going to be. I mean, they're going to be assessed. They should be on the hook for what they're assessed for. Why in the heck are you making them be on the hook for twenty eight million dollars? I don't I don't understand that. No, that's what I have to say, and I will listen to the rest of it. And I apologize that I have to leave. And thank you all for letting me jump in. Thank you, Mr. Bosky. Mr. Croft. Yeah, I wrote down uh, five questions. I want to get through them quickly, but I, I just had a totally different recollection of that. I remember uh, the angry con uh, uh, constituents there, and us saying, "This is a pass through. You're not going to get connected. You're not. It's going to be there, but it's not really going to be there because it's heading to the project, and the project will pay for the it by assessment." That that was always the understanding, and I never remember a discussion that we would pay taxpayer money to do it or um, or general assessment but so the, the question I have, I can't tell from these documents it seems to say a municipal appropriation do you expect to pay for this trunk line with assessments either general assessment or assessment specifically to this or some combination or appropriation what pays for that trunk line in each of the sides opinion a Wu through special and general assessment or assembly appropriation? Because the attachment A says assembly appropriation. That's right, because I think the assembly does have to appropriate. The ICA is essentially that, con that conversation that does talk about who appropriates, what funds are they talking about. When you go back to these two pipe sizes, this distribution line is always an assessment. It, all, it is now. So when you hook up to that, you're going to get assessed. So the assessments uh, uh, ar argument, the assessment conversation, for the distribution side remains just like okay right you say taxpayer money a bill follows the who oh, should pay for that trunk one, line? I'm thirsty. Uh -oh. the ICA speaks at this point big to, one to, taxpayer to, money small one a will assess it's a funding source not necessarily taxpayer money it, 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 that was never the combination that says that a ratepayer dollar that's different than a taxpayer so I think the idea is that that's what I'm asking just very briefly sir is it is it a woo assessment or appropriation from us. Likely if in our perfect world would be a combination of all of the above. Mr. Falsey. I think the framework that we committed to and the only thing that the tariff lets us do now is proceed on the course where it's paid by the property owners through an individual assessment. So Pete, when the line is built in front of his road. And the open question is what happens if Pete never comes? Got it. That should be and then what is the appropriate you don't get to interrupt anymore <laughs> you I'm not sure you got to before but you don't get to now the um, what 
is the appropriate division of that $20 million. That is, I it looked like in your initial offer it is all of it on special assessment. Yeah, is there any division of that that should be general assessment versus special? So that, that's my personal reaction to all of this, is that it does seem like that fouled the waters right away. Because our opening pitch said the transmission improvement district is 100% paid for through assessments. Now, we can have a conversation about whether that is right, whether it's 100-0 an existing a group because maybe there is a redundancy that we didn't fully anticipate or so we could maybe say it's 80 20 we, well that's a technical that is where we've been saying let's get the technical people in the room to talk about that cost sharing does a have a position on whether there's enough benefit that some portion of it could be uh, brought as part of the general rate base rather than special assessment Come on up because she's going to be hearing this on and everybody, but she's going to be hearing it on tape. So say it loud and proud. And so we've been, we've been identify, planning sure to we'll build this water treatment mission main for a long time, um, and we've been planning that in view of the development that's going to take place, particularly in the Potter Reserve, and sometime in the future, maybe not next year, maybe not 10 years from now, maybe not 50 years from now. There's going to be an interest, as Amy has pointed out, some of the neighbors in the South Birchwood area are going to want to have public water as well. They say um, no, but okay. Well, Most no, of them say, say no, no. But there are other folks that, that have said, it'd be nice if, if my house got the water, even so though the what, neighborhood what? doesn't want it. So let me continue. Um, so the, uh, the reason we would uh, take the project on at any point in time is when it's ripe for development. We're not going to build a water transmission line, line and hope that the development occurs. So we went through the process of developing the water transmission improvement district process, um, a tool that we could use to uh, make sure that the, that the larger uh, trunk lines and transmission lines have the cost distributed over assessed properties. In this particular case, the $20 million, water only, as Bill said, we're going to set the sewer aside, uh, is only for the water transmission main from Chugiak High School down to North Eagle River. Got that. Slightly less than half of that is Powder Reserve property. The assessment that would accrue to the Powder Reserve property is the proportional amount of that cost. So you're already only assessing them for half, and half is in the general rate base of AWU? Uh, correct. And then as hookups occur on the northern section, uh, which might again be 20 years or 30 years or 50 years, um, the property owners there will pay the assessments uh, for their um, pro rata portion. Okay, so the answer was 50%. Did Close enough. Can yeah. we just have a breakthrough? We just saved everybody $10 million? That's right. <laughs> so you were only going to assess, t if it's right, 10 million, 50%, but let's say 10 million to the uh, uh, Powder Ridge or Powder Hill. Powder, Powder Reserve would be responsible for their aerial portion of the the overall large transmission improvement district, which is about half. Okay, well, I've got you, and just quickly, because I, I don't want to dumb it time, but I want to get these answered. What um, Does AWU normally pay, uh, ask developments to pay for transmission lines or only distribution lines? Uh, the water transmission line is, is not a common thing. However, we've had, uh, Mark or Steve, we've had five developments in the past 15 years in Eagle River where there have there has been a need for to bring water from existing AWU facilities to a subdivision. You could call it a transmission main. Uh, we have 16-inch lines, we've got some 24-inch lines. The developers paid for all of that. Okay. Can, can I inject that? Yeah. Because you asked a really good question. You talked about 10 million, 10 million. Was that including his understanding? Or did you think you were going to be for the whole 20 million? Did we have some kind of miscommunication here, or are we talking I, I, Pass each other. I, I think we're. I think we're. We've always. We've all, if the infrastructure's there, we tap into it, and the people who buy the lot, it ends up being part of the cost of the lot. So we've always paid that. Yeah. Where things really started to go is, well, you're going to be on the hook if it's not developed. Which one? There's such a track record of all of our stuff being developed. Uh, the other tone and tenor changed where, well, we. I won't rehash. Well, are you? Are they on the hook for the part that is 
out of it. I mean, if it's $20 million is the total cost. School districts would have to pay for their portion in this area. Yep. MEA would have to pay for their portion. We would have to pay for our portion. But isn't there a portion that's even outside yeah. of that? That's yeah, what yeah for the water side, there is. Yeah, and, that, and, and that's one of the reasons we couldn't develop. We, we were so close to developing these phase that it came within a couple months, and that's when uh, Abel talked about underneath the Glen Highway, there were a couple bulks that couldn't handle the capacity. So there's some infrastructure that's not 100% related to us. A lot of these two and a half acre lots and subdivided lots are currently developed. They currently have on-site water and wastewater. They're not interested in having public water right now. There are some whose septic systems and water systems are failing. They are interested in having water right now, but they're not interested in, in uh, paying the whole cost of the development, but they would uh, willingly share in the cost with an assessment of their pro rata share. This, you know, one acre here of the whole project cost. There's municipal property up here, Breach Lake Park. Um, it, were there to be development uh, in the park areas, the municipality would pay the assessment for water and sewer uh, on municipal property as well. And, and if you were to upfront the money for the construction, you would hold the risk that people didn't develop or didn't hook up for $10 million indefinitely. Uh, until yes. the blues came in, until the blues until decided the to, come decide in. to come in. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. That's correct. And when the they do, the they difference is that in this tariff, in 8.3 and also in 10.3, uh, it's incumbent on the utility to, to to go forward with the project only if it's determined to be economically feasible or if there or if there are ways to ensure that there's recovery of costs. So we want to ensure, uh, as we propose in the ICA, that, that the upon reserve portion of the cost are recoverable through a guarantee of payments. Not for this part, but for this part, because we can uh, we can build that water transmission improvement district and build a water tra transmission main. Uh, to serve that development. Okay. And when I, need the add, I need to, I'm sorry, I need to add one thing. There's two assessments that will occur. That, that This is where the blending conversation occurs. There's two assessments. You're going to assess the neighborhood for that, and then when they hook up, you're going to assess them again for that. Just so what I was going to say. So when yeah. they, the blue people come in, they're assessed for their proportionate part of that, and then you build those that weren't built yet. Well, that depends on how, that, how the, the subsidiary development takes place. A private developer, uh, well, actually, let's think about the, the, the corollary um, uh, resolution that we put in front of the assembly last December, and that is you can't have an improvement district for distribution mains in this area. Yep. Because we don't want, yeah. uh, Got for that. those example, we don't want Pete to pay for, for, for a pipe that Dennis and, and Amy might want. Yep. Um, but if I'm in lot 141 and I'm, I'm Right. Significantly motivated. I got to move on. The, we the got all that. Line. I'm going to do that as a private developer. Okay. And I could do that. Well, I want just one more and I'll let it go. What portion do you think I should pay of that with general fund, if you will, tax money appropriations? They've said this is a 50 50, 50% 50 assessment, 50% held and later done, and AWU pays for it. How much of that 20 million do you want me to write you a check for? None by a tax dollars, by any means. There's the repayment by the ratepayers. There's the how much of any appropriation as opposed to a WU assessment? It's, it, you're, you're right on the mark. It's who's the benefited party? And, and the benefited how party much? Is the benefited party for the 24 inch line, you, you, including is going to pay for the distribution, none of the trunk because they don't benefit from it. So, so I should write a $10 million check. Or Thank a you. should write. No, he means, and that's why no. that we should write and not have it assessed to that project. If the ten million that, that would otherwise be assessed on those, you want me to find that money, appropriate that yeah, money. That that's money. the thing. Yeah. Thank you. From the clean water fund, it could from the rate payer well, dollars. Clean water fund, you have to pay back. Could be a combination of the ratepayer dollars pays back. It doesn't know. Well, no. Okay, but I was asking between ratepayer and appropriation. This before me. That, Exhibit A says appropriation. Funding source, source of funds. I mean, maybe you're more literal with tax dollars being that appropriation, but somebody has to say, um, we're going to go into GO bond debt, we're going to go into that. Somebody has to say that's the appropriation mechanism. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, 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 I mean, yeah, the GO, GO bonds are taxpayer dollars. And right? the AWW has some of those now, right? The, uh, okay, let's, GO bonds. we have some other, uh, we have some, okay, we have some other questions. Let's keep pressing forward. Uh, we have John and then uh, Austin. 
So we have no more Austin. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> So, um, Brett, for someone, the, uh, is that a, an Elmore, is that a, how big is that one? Um, is that 24 inch? Yes. This thing? Yeah. Basically what we're talking here. Yeah. Who paid for that? Uh, we paid for that on the basis of serving existing customers in the area. Not on the basis of development. In fact, that doesn't support development in the area because we've recruited the, uh, the use of that main to extend uh, service to areas that don't actually know. Thanks. Is that your only question, John? Uh, to some extent, yeah, I guess. Uh, for now. Eric, you had five questions. <coughs> I only heard you ask three. It, the way they answered compressed them, I think I got it. Okay. Uh, Austin is gone. Hey, John, you do a follow up, and then I'd like to hear some more from. Bill, about where you think we stand after this discussion, if you think there have been anything here that, or anything you'd like to clarify. Like, for example, there's this question of 2.1.4 uh, and tariff 10 versus tariff 8. I'd hear, I've been curious about that kind of stuff. But, John, why don't you ask first? Well, it might tie into that, so maybe that's the answer. But so, you know, we heard a lot of history and, you know, there's been a plan. That this development is really just a benefit of the city. It clearly doesn't make that much money off of it. And so on. But to me, all of that is—is is that relevant at all? It's all side stories because we cut a deal a year or two ago that was a methane gas deal, and that's the deal now. All that other stuff is gone, and to bring that in is inappropriate. I mean, are we pretty clear with that methane gas? What was the acronym? I'm calling it the methane yeah, gas. Yeah, yeah. that's okay. fine. But it has a step-by-step -step thing. That's what we do. And the only confusion, I guess, is what percent of that twenty million dollar pipe would they potentially be on the hook for? That's right. Yeah. Well, I think the way I'll answer that is to say we can only do what we're authorized by law to do. So we're trying to use the tariff we have, and that tariff we have allows us to fulfill the obligations we pledged to. Two point one point three. I don't see an alternative to that. that is likely to bring the project into fruition. I don't think that makes the history irrelevant. I wasn't around for any of that history. I don't have the benefit of knowing all that history. But I can't imagine that there was ever a time where the municipality promised to hold a $28 million risk because the municipality in England are not housing developers. If the project fails, we would hold all the downside risk. If the project succeeds, we would get none of the upside risk. I hope that a Curtis is saying is true, that these things are going to sell like hotcakes, in which case this should be easy because Pete is coming and Pete's going to pay for this and none of this is going to matter. But I think the bottom line for me as a result of all this is there's probably some real discussions that we can and should have about whether the total sensible costs are the 100% to 50% of the cost in that polygon or some other number. And we do have to get a guarantee from a Kutna that they will cover the problem. They will make us whole if the project never comes into existence. Well, I, I, Unless I, I, someone else can find Bill, Bill Gates or Michael Bloomberg comes back to town. <laughs> I, wanted to, I did want to ask you about that, uh, Curtis. You know, I mean, a lot of what we're asking about here is sort of, as is often the case in these kind of things, we're talking about risk being passed side, one side to another. But you have stated, and I believe you, that these that there's a lot of pressure to build these, that, that that you're going to build these, and if that's the case, then the, the risk is relatively low. So, wh why are you resistant to, to carrying a, a larger a larger portion of a relatively small risk? So something something fresh came up, and, and, and I, I want to say, and Bill Starr gave a lot of compliments. So I, I think I think we can get there. Uh, how uh, I think getting this funded and moving forward, I think that's where you guys help able play a role so we can be we can be turning and burning in 2020 with people moving in i do believe that in 20 years this place will be full with when we were in a meeting a while back there was a, a, a year thrown out which was un, unacceptable to us what bill said today in his presentation he, he said the word 40 years if we're talking 40 years then maybe we can be at the table if we're saying in 40 years from now including us not going to not uh, not deliver. There is not an agreement we have ever signed with the city that we have failed. The, the city has in the past. That's why we're very resistant. It's never us who has failed on anything we have signed. It has been the city 
in the past that have. So we're skittish and nervous about that. Yeah. If he's saying, okay, Curtis, would you sign a document that says 40 years from now, if part of this is left and you guys stick your neck out, then that could be a number that we might be able to step so, up to. Because I don't think 40 years from now that's going to be an issue. So that's an interesting question. That's 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 a one way to reduce risk, right? Would be to stretch it out over a longer portion. And I'll say I have no idea if 48 years is doable. I think the assessments are paid back 30 years, so maybe that might be in general. Well, we can have those conversations. We can shape those guarantees. What's however, the, but it's gonna it's gonna affect the ultimate. Is it economically feasible? Sure. So what's the what's the remodeling question? Unless I'm thinking about this the wrong way. What's the repayment term on a on a Clean Water Act loan? Twenty to thirty years. So, okay. Pete, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, the, re the, reason, <laughs> the reason we're having this conversation is because we're not sure of the economic situation we find ourselves in. If we had an economy that was humming along uh, like it was a dozen years ago, we wouldn't be worried about building a subdivision because people would be, be putting up houses as fast as they could get the wood delivered out there. So it, we, we're trying to ass reassure ourselves that the economy uh, in Alaska is, is going to continue to grow. Is, 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 am, I, am I reading this wrong? Well, every family in Alaska is going to have money for a down payment in like three <laughs> months. <laughs> uh, but no, I think your general reading the situation is right. If we were Seattle, this wouldn't be an issue, right? We would be like, this is absolutely going to get built. Although in that case, perhaps the Clutuna would be more willing to take a shorter, I mean, take on more risk, because you know you're absolutely going to sell them and sell them quickly and be able to build them quickly. Well, I'll give you something interesting. Um, the city would not, uh, and Robin Ward, uh, if she was in the room, I'd, I'd ask her to step up. Uh, the city... Another one of our frustrations is after all the years of asking us to be the one to step up and after all the money we've spent here, uh, Park Heritage Land Bank is putting a lot of land out all of a sudden. Why are they putting a lot of land out? The yeah. builders are looking for land. The market is there. There are folks looking for that. And so Robin has suspended the idea of above the McDonald's Center trying to put all those lots in because I was in public meeting with her. She got inundated with people in Eagle River saying, wait a minute. We've been all ready for this. Let this happen before you put that other parcel. And Robin, on the record there, said, and Ethan was there, the mayor was there, saying, yeah, let's let Powder Ridge happen first. Why would Heritage Land Bank be wanting to put all this land into play? Because there's such the need for that. So even at the slowest market, there are people wanting single-family lots. We're feeling the phone is ringing at a clue now from builders, freaking out because we haven't put another phase in, and we keep saying we don't have the infrastructure. Thank so you. the need is there. Thank you. Uh, you had a question, John? Or somebody raised well, I hand. think someone on that point, because I know we've only done you know, a few hundred building single so family home permits in Lincoln and Anchorage in the last year. I mean, it's super low, but in Valley, we've got 7,800 or so, aren't they? That's a question. Yeah. Really yeah. But it's, they're yeah. building like crazy. We're sure. not. And this is kind of in between. What, what would your lot cost be? Uh, uh, and we were about 75000 is uh, per single family lot is what we're in, uh, you talk to a, a Spinell or a Peterson who's been in a lot longer, I think those guys have probably got it down into about the $60,000 range, but we're also, you know, we're building, so we're trying to get it down there, but that's what is averaging our cost. And then on a Are good day- Are those acre, acre to quarter lots? Two acre uh, what? They're, they're what the average size is uh, uh, between eight and 12 Quarter acre. Quarter, quarter acre. acre. Quarter acre, yeah. quarter acre? Yeah. okay, thank you. John, do you have a follow-up to that, or Eric had a question behind you. Eric? Well, so, and I think that's right. There's so much demand. We're not really try, talking about writing a check, right? It's just what happens if they don't sell? Why are you worried if it's almost guaranteed to? I'm not worried. Well, then who cares about this contingent that's almost not going to happen? There, 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 was a, there was a change from this is a high priority to maybe in a couple years. There was a and it may have been a misunderstanding. But I don't, there was a change from, uh, okay, you guys, we want to qualify when, when you're on the hook for it. And then there was a re, it feels like there's been a reprioritization after all of our board's been through. And so we've been wondering, we've been feeling like there's a change in tone intent. Can I add? Well, but, but there's, the actual words of the document are what matter. And if we're talking about a risk that's almost 
uh, no, surely not going to happen. That shouldn't get in the way of a of a project. We're, we're not talking about actually writing a check. We're talking about what happens if nobody buys those lots. And and I think that's right. That's a pretty low probability. So why let that screw up the whole thing? So, why let that risk be the thing that kills the deal? And we're not here to kill the deal. Well, it, it, why is that the thing that seems to have stalled the deal? There was that, and, and there, there, was, there was another thing that was frustrating, and I tried to be polite about it, Front end, and that was in a few meetings because of our history with keeping the assembly informed. Because the assembly, and we've had members reaching out to us about it. It was a little bit of a hey, don't talk to the assembly, don't ed to talk to us. And we got frustrated with that, and and we felt like we should be keeping the assembly informed. And I'll go back to that meeting on the seal. And that was I had assembly members asking me about this project. So why is the work session? I think we're here. One of the main reasons for the work session is to educate the assembly on where we are. Had you heard from Bill on all these details prior to today's work session? No. Have you heard from our Bill prior to today's work session? No. Have you heard from me on the history? No. So I'm. We're here today looking at what a positive, uh, call it, uh, a facilitator, a work session with the assembly is. Because at the end of the day, we kept saying, even at the terms of the methane, it is the assembly, ultimately that is going to be the ones that are making the decision on the tone, the pace, the funding, the so forth. So and that, we're really here for that. Bill, you had something you wanted to say. I did. Other number Bill? two, I'm sorry, number two of your request here <coughs> speaks to legislation that says put it back in AWW capital plan. It was in AWW's capital plan last year. It's not this year. So more indicators that it's kind of about face is that AWW doesn't even list it as a funded project in 2019. It came out. You guys appropriated $3.4 million to the project conversation last year, 2018, which is in your packet. 2019, the project's not even listed, much less what the funding source is going to be, all the other stuff. It's out of the queue, which is going back to the guidance that's in the, in the uh, work plan of AWW. Steve, can you speak to that? Okay, real quick. Uh, one back. We have 2.8 million currently right now waiting to kick off the design on the water. We have 1.6 million currently in waiting to kick off the design on the sewer. It's in. It's in. It's already money in my hands, ready to go as soon as we got the yes. Well, you then what is last year? What is this about? 2014 master so plan is it already there? The the funding is there. Flip to the next slide if you would please. Bill. I said this, I think Forrest and Dick Trainee were the only ones in the room last November. In terms of, oh, oh, sorry, sorry. In terms of the way I've programmed the capital budget, because I don't know if this is going forward, I need a clue that say yes, and I think I told them last week, just say yes. Um, <laughs> I have the money for the construction for both the water and sewer distributed right now. It goes four million one year, 4.5, 2.5, 6.5, Bill Starr was sitting in that seat last year. He said, this begs the question to commitment. I said, we may have to adjust this to put all the appropriation into one year. We would not change the area under the curve, the total value of AWW's capital improvement program over a period of time. But what you would see is I would lump all this together for here, such that we had a spike in our capital program to fund the construction. It's in here right now, assuming a construction start of 2020. That includes both the TID portion for sewer, and then what we're referring to as the Post Station 58, the capital improvement portion of the sewer work that is done as part of the infrastructure coordination <laughs> on the sewer. It's in there, it's programmed, it's in your packet. You guys are voting on that on the 20. Program is not budget, though. That's the, that's the issue, though. You programmed it, but you didn't fund it. And you don't find it until you need it for construction, 2020. Okay, so great. Lot, a, a ton of information. Uh, if I could have made three hours, I would have. Um, but I, I'm gonna say, uh, you know, I, I think we had a, a positive discussion. Obviously, there's a lot of stuff for us to consume. Um, I wanna give uh, either Ethan or Bill Falsey the last chance that, I mean, Ethan, you're in the room, do you have any Thing you want to say on this? I mean, it's something that you've spoken to before. If not, I'll let your uh, your city manager do it. Well, I, I missed a good chunk of this, but I, I will say this: is I think some of the, the and there's this here from us at the bill for the station for um, a little bit of criticism. Um, this is a project that I think can happen. There are some legal hurdles that need to be surmounted. It would be incredibly helpful. If
I agree. And, you know, I think Curtis spoke a lot to the history, to the role of the municipality and, and the Klutna and their relationship to each other. I do believe that we are in agreement on that stuff. I do think that we want you to build this housing. I do think we are incredibly appreciative of all that Klutna has done in terms of school sites and, you know, putting using your land for water lines and that kind of thing. Um, and so I hope we can keep that big picture in mind as we drill down to what needs to a very technical negotiation that needs to happen, I think, between, you know, the two parties. Anyway, with that, I'm going to close. Did, 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 uh, Bill want to say something? I'll say, I understood what everyone else has said. We're still interested. I still think we have a very clear path forward to get it actually built. What we need to do is get some technocrats in the room to start jockeying some spreadsheets. That's what's got to happen now. So the, the all the branch is open. The invitation has been extended. Let's put people in the war room and let's hammer it out. Great. All right, with that, I'm going to close this work session.